For the last theory that I want to introduce for organizations, I want to focus on a class of theories whose goal is fundamentally different, that instead of really focusing on productivity and organizational objectives, highlights the employee experience. Critical theory, in general, focuses on giving a voice to marginalized groups, and in the organizational context, argues that employees are inherently marginalized because they don't control their own destinies or even their daily work routines in many cases. The key assumption with all critical theory is the focus on social justice. Now, while this has received a lot of emphasis in the popular media in the last few years, there are some pragmatic reasons to do this when we're considering theories of organizing. In part, this underpins the global labor movement. However, one of the principal criticisms of critical theory is that all too often it's focused on identifying the problems, but not offering the solutions. We see this in a lot of popular discourse and certainly research applying critical theory. However, if the central objective of critical theory is to give voice to marginalized groups, then there must be a solutions focus. This graphic shows the process of critique done in a practical kind of way that goes from the identification of problems to their diagnosis, to formulating solutions, then to developing and implementing plans of action identifying what was successful, and finally institutionalizing those best new practices. This reflects a strong level of problem solving and the process, and this is exactly what critical theory should do. So it's within this context that I want to introduce one example of a critical theory that has very practical implications in organizational settings. That theory is invitational rhetoric. Invitational rhetoric was developed by Sonia Foss and Cindy Griffin as a different way to think about conversations and interactions in a lot of different spheres, but especially the organizational sphere. It's grounded by feminist assumptions of gender-based communication or who we are as communicators inherently. They argue that there's a belief that the preferred communication model for interacting is masculine because of a focus on persuasion and that feminine approaches to communication based on collaboration are silenced, especially in organizational settings. Now, beyond this and the debate over what is feminine and masculine in terms of the style of communication, the heart of the critique and in invitational rhetoric is that how we communicate in organizations is often too focused on competitiveness and assertiveness, which silences and excludes people who are less comfortable with direct conflict and often disproportionately silences people who are not within the majority within that organization's demographics. So it's based on three principles, the first of which is equality. And to say that you want to implement an invitational style of rhetoric within an organization means that there has to be a commitment to replace the dominant and elitism that characterizes a lot of human relationships with intimacy and camaraderie. So moving away from hierarchy towards a model of teamwork. The second core principle is imminent value. And this assumes that all people have something to offer. And when we interact with people, we should assume that everyone, no matter their role, has something to offer the conversation. So they argue that existing power structures often have a lot less meaning. And in a practical sense, the objective in creating imminent value is creating ways for everyone to have their voice heard, to be included in decision making and encouraged to participate actively. And the third principle of invitational rhetoric is self-determination, which focuses on enabling people to make their own decisions about outcomes of any interaction. So in an organizational setting, it means that people should be able to stand up for themselves, talk about their interests and their goals, and not have those discounted by the organization. By adopting these core principles, it leads to particular rhetorical forms. Now, don't worry too much about the language used, but the rhetorical forms are really what people have to do in order to adopt the invitational rhetoric approach to interacting. So the theory argues that to have an, a more inclusive and positive work environment, we should modify our communication styles to include the following. First, offering perspectives. In offering perspective, each person shares what they currently know or understand. 
They present their vision for a problem or an issue and show how it looks and works for them. This vision represents an initial tentative commitment to that perspective, and this, they argue, stands in direct contrast to powerful statements asserting that a single person has the answers. So the person is willing to change based on the interaction that comes after the perspective is offered. And so what this means in an organizational context is ensuring that different people are able to offer different perspectives and that those perspectives then can be worked out and negotiated in order to come to the best group decision about how those perspectives can be interpreted and what kinds of actions can take place thereafter. The second communicative behavior that has to be adopted from an invitational rhetoric perspective is creating the conditions to allow other people to present their perspectives. So this is the most important component in organizational settings, according to the invitational rhetoric scholars. So if it's meant to be invitational, then it must result in a mutual understanding of different perspectives. Of course, this means that everyone has to be willing to share their perspectives. So in creating the conditions to share, it's about facilitating a meaningful interaction. And there are three conditions that have to be satisfied in order for this to work. In order to create the conditions to share, there first must be safety. And this focuses on creating a feeling of security among the people interacting. It means that people have to feel like their perspective will be valued and that there will be no negative repercussions for actually speaking up. The second necessary condition is value. This is created when a speaker approaches colleagues on their own terms, avoiding distancing, paternalistic, and depersonalizing attitudes. It's fostered through good listening and trying to adopt different people's perspectives. Think about walking a mile in their shoes. The third requirement for creating conditions to share is freedom. Freedom in this context means genuinely giving people the power to choose or decide what the outcomes of the interaction are. The leader doesn't restrict options or telling the participants what they should and shouldn't bring to the table. So anyone can bring any and all matters to the interaction for consideration. There is no privileging of particular ideas based on who has presented them. So the group then chooses the ideas together. In the end, if we compare traditional interactions in organizations with a vision for how we communicate in professional settings from an invitational rhetoric perspective, you can certainly see points of divergence. First, instead of persuading people that we are right, we should have a conversation and offer our perspectives and then listen to other perspectives. Second, instead of relying on the hierarchy within an organization to come to decisions, leaders should present themselves neutrally in order to listen to different perspectives and in fact seek out those different perspectives, especially from those that they know often have a different viewpoint. Third, there will be some situations where consensus or agreement cannot be achieved. But instead of demanding that everyone agrees, identifying those that disagree as having specific and valid concerns is a practical way not only to communicate to those people that they are important, but it also removes a win-lose perspective and can actually improve decision making by more fully considering risks and issues that could affect the organization. Fourth, Instead of adopting a directive approach when change or policy is introduced, it should be positioned in a way that employees willingly adopt. So making sure that everyone believes the actions are in their own and the organization's best interests, or at least to the degree possible. And finally, instead of having a singular or linear perspective, focusing on decisions that come from and adopt multiple perspectives. In this way, invitational rhetoric focuses on the objectives, which is to improve employee voice and the environment within the organization, but it also complements participative and supportive organizational environments. When we consider the purpose of theories, they're meant to give us a pathway for understanding organizations, solving problems, and improving all experiences and outcomes within an organization. 
There is no single theory that has all the answers. And quite frankly, it's very possible that multiple theories present viable pathways. So it's about matching theory, situation, and objectives.